can you Adam and Eve it? Tim is stalking Reds on a beach of hidden bombs on the site of the Eden TV show. And we have more kite optics for you to win. That's slightly worrying. <laughs> Plus I'm with Jaff and the gang ferreting in Somerset. We've got news, we've got hunting YouTube, Happy New Year and welcome to Field Sports Britain in our 10th anniversary year. Hunting offers access to some weird and wonderful places. For Tim, that place is on the west coast of Scotland on the northern coast of the Ardnamurchan Peninsula, and he's got a beautiful beach all to himself. Anybody that's watching this and saw the Eden Project on television, mm. they'll know that you should be able to survive there for a year because they did. <laughs> <laughs> West Highland hunting allows stalkers to hunt particular grounds unguided if they have a deer stalking certificate level 2 and show they are a competent shot. Tim went solo last year with Robbie Rowntree. This time brother Neil has organised two outings for us on hinds and calves. But we certainly didn't expect a trip to the beach, and not just any beach. That's slightly worrying. <laughs> the, the area is commercial timber as you can see. It's coming to its felling stage and uh, what we're looking to do there this year is to kick off and start shooting a few hides. It's an interesting piece of ground, it's a, it's a sandy, white sandy beach, stunning location. The deer are very mobile in the area, particularly when the tide falls back you'll get them right down on the, the shoreline eating seaweed and when the tide's in like it is this morning you'll get them grazing on the grassland tight on the edge of the forest. Right? Okay. So what I'm going to do is set you off down the, the forest edge along the shore only task, make sure if you're shooting an adult female, any dependent young come mm. with her. And uh, bear in mind that when the tide falls back, we've got a very small window to get them out. Mm. If uh, you don't get them out, then you're swimming out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other than that, have a lot of fun. Great spot, a lot of history attached to it. It was used extensively for commander training and for military training before the last war. And you'll see when you get to the, the beach why they used that beachhead for training. Okay. If you do see anything sticking out of the sand, it could be ordnance. There okay. are still the odd mills bomb, mortars and other sweet things popping out the sand from time to time. Okay. So I wouldn't A shoot it or B stamp it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the concept of going in blind into, into a property stalking is, is probably the ultimate challenge in some ways, isn't it? Yep. If you know the land, you'd roughly know where it is, but we haven't got a clue. It's great to be able to have the opportunity to do it. So yes. One of the things I think comes out of this, I spent quite a lot of my career with the Forestry Commission. And we know these days that people are increasingly relying on shooting deer out of season and relying on shooting deer at night. Mm. And, and I think there's a, there's a huge role for guys like yourselves in forests like this to actually go and, uh, you could say, cull deer by fair chase. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think it's a healthy practice, it produces healthy meat, and at the same time, it reduces the burden on the taxpayer. Once again, rucksack and rifle is, is taking me to slightly unusual destinations. And uh, this is completely unique. And uh, as I said earlier on, the, the history involved with the site with regards to the D-Day landings, World War II, they trained the SE, the Special Operations Executive here. There's so much going on here, but to actually maybe hunt red deer next to sand dunes is absolutely amazing. There are some benefits to stalking on the beach. The breaking waves disguise noise, but the wind direction is a pain and the way we've had to come in could clear the beach of animals.
We need to stay in the cover, but you can't help being drawn to the sound just for the novelty factor. Tim experienced something similar in Argentina. I normally go to really hot climates to, to uh, enjoy myself on the sand. This is amazing. It's interesting that uh, in August I was actually stalking Axis Deer in Argentina on sand dunes in the middle of the, comp in, in the, middle of the country with palm trees. Four months later, I'm in Scotland stalking red deer on sand dunes. It's so unique. Like, just look at it. Heading out with east that way is just staggering. But, you know, to have red deer here is uh, it's fascinating. So what we're going to do is just try to find them. There's a lot of evidence as you walk through the top here. There's a lot of evidence actually of, of, uh, of deer here. A lot of very, very fresh kind of um, pellets out there. So hopefully we get close. But I think at the moment we've got to kind of work our way over the top and look down onto them. So. Um, pretty exciting actually, and it's lovely weather, no, no gloves, so it's perfect, perfect conditions. The problem we've got is the wind's kind of quartering from behind us to over there, so I'm not very happy about that, so we've got to be very, very mindful of that. So hopefully we have to spot the deer first before they actually are sent us. Anyway, let's crack on. There are definitely deer here. The slots give that away. Maybe they've gone for a dip. There's been quite a few deer go through here. You see across the sands there, they've been working their way across out to that far, far knoll, I suppose. It's obviously there about. Good sign. Typical beach cuisine with the ice cream or a sand encrusted fish paste sandwich. However, Tim decides to try kelp for the first and last time. So this is what the deer are going for. They love the old uh, seaweed and kelp. Just because it tastes very nice. No, it doesn't. Ooh. We work steadily along the coastline, coves and rocks giving us cover. Then Tim returns looking like he's just been given a Mr Whippy 99 with two flakes. For international viewers, that's the king of ice creams. We've got to sell some deer. Wow, I was just scanning, glassing everywhere. And the same old thing, it's like, they're there. Quite embarrassing really, but that's what happens. You kind of, you're thinking that they could be anywhere. Just scanning around and suddenly completely miss them. I think there's two, two youngsters down there, so I don't know what sex they are yet. Anyway, so I've got ourselves a beast to look at. It's really exciting. Probably, I guess, about 200 metres away, but we'll have a look and see what we think anyway. Okay, this moves. The highs and lows of hunting. Oh, it's so frustrating. We bellied all the way around the old knoll here, 165 metres away. Look, everything looked absolutely fine, setting up for the shot. A lot of wind coming down the valley there. And for some reason, it just looked up, didn't look at us and spent straight across the side into the, into the wood. I think what's happened here is the wind is actually going from, from there all the way around to there. The weather, it just, it just threw our scent across the valley there, but we did everything right. <laughs> I was really getting quite excited on this one because it's like a reasonably simple shot as well. Anyway, so we've drawn a blank, so uh, we'll keep on going over the other side of that, um, that nolly there and see what else is there, but uh, I think we'll probably have, to have a bar of chocolate for about 15 minutes to see if this youngster, I think it was a young calf actually, wow. so there's probably a, a hind near it somewhere. I'd rather hope it may just drift back out again, because the way it just jumped up and I thought, ouch, I'm on my own here, I'm away from my mum, and just went straight across there, so just wait up for a few minutes, if not we head on, but uh, so close. And that's why we hunt. You never, never know what's around the corner, and it's never, it's never prescribed. It's there, and sometimes it's not. So it wasn't meant to be. But we've got another hour yet before we head back to Glasgow. So I'm rather hoping we have another opportunity. Sadly, like all delicious ice creams, the deer disappear, leaving us with just a beautiful view of where they once stood. Before we head back, Tim talks us through his very cute Hakila rucksack. I do. It's probably maybe 20 litres maximum of that. This one's made out of melting wool, so it's very, very quiet. But um, I've been using it quite a bit for the last uh, six months. 
It's got a few little pockets as I normally have, but what I really like about it is the, is the ability to carry the rifle in the back. And, and also the actual rifle is very close to my back, so it doesn't wobble around too much. And uh, I've been rather impressed with it actually. Um, there's enough provisions there for maybe for a day, mooching around the, the hill, lots of little pockets everywhere else. And just the, the rifle itself falls into it. And, uh, and off I go, walking with it. So it does work very, very well actually. So, uh, yeah. We've been walking all day and they turn up in a flipping vehicle like that. Now I bet they got loads of deer in the back of it just to make us feel even worse. While we have been beachcombing, Neil and Stevie have been busy stalking the rest of the forest and have had a bit more success. But they have been here before, of course. Just uh, 30 seconds more and we've got it. But that's where it goes. My fault, then. Maybe your fault. It's always, 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 always waiting for the camera. <laughs> There's a common denominator here. Yes, yes. <laughs> David Wright, the conservationist. <laughs> Did you hear him muttering under his breath, run away, yes. run away? Please, please, please. Weren't successful today, but it doesn't really matter. Actually, we saw a beast. It, uh, I think nature took its way, um, you know, and it went off. So that's, that's hunting for you. But what a way to finish. Beautiful sand dunes here. A bit of history as well, going back to World War II. But uh, if you want to uh, have some adventurous stalking, come to the western coast of Scotland, because you can't beat it. What a weird and wonderful stalking experience, and if you fancy the chance of doing something like this, contact West Highland Hunting for more information. For more about these Steyr manlickers, go to styrearms.com. For the Harkila kit and clothing, go to harkila.com. And for more about Kite Optics, go to kiteoptics.com. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, West Highland Hunting. What a place. Now we've got more Kite Optics binos with their 30 year warranties to give away. This week it's Kite Optics petrol binos. All you have to do to enter the draw to win it is write I spy kite in the description below this film on YouTube or on Facebook or Instagram and we'll make the draw in a few weeks time. We have got quite a lot of draws to do from December. We won't do them this week, we'll do them next week. Now fresh from his alcohol fueled fortnight is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Antis have been trying to portray Boxing Day as a day of violence. They have bombarded the media with claims of attacks on them by Hunt supporters, which has drowned out the real story of the hundreds of thousands of people who turned out to cheer their hunts in market towns around the UK. The Antis have hit pubs and hotels which allow meets with death threats and bad reviews on TripAdvisor. Some, including the Crown Hotel in Bawtree, have hit back. Others, such as the Harvey's brewery chain, have sided with the Antis. Harvey slapped the wrist of one of its landlords after he posted this notice at his pub in Lewis. A master of the Torrington Farmers Hunt told a small group of protesters that they were unwashed and unemployed, though that is apparently not illegal in Devon. A fox has attacked a baby in Norway. Bjorn Milliam Angle found a mangy fox in the baby's cot. He threw a flower pot at the animal, then grabbed the pram and pulled it away from the fox. The baby is recovering from scratches on his cheek and local fox shooters have been informed. Thanks to Per Holmseth for sending us the story. A car overturned in the Cotswolds after the driver attempted to dodge a pheasant. The driver had attempted to swerve around the pheasant in the road and ended up rolling her car. She was checked by the ambulance service and given the all clear. A Spanish hunter who was filmed chasing and torturing a fox has been identified. The civil guard says the man who's 35 faces charges of crimes against wildlife. And finally, an Amish has been fined £22,000 and given a 60-day jail sentence for poaching. Junior L. Troyer, who's 43 and from Ohio, entered pleas of no contest to several hunting crimes surrounding the poaching of a 28-point white-tailed buck. He also faces a two-year hunting ban. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now they say never work with children and animals. Well, I've been out with ferrets, dogs, rabbits and ferreters. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Thank you. 
We are faced with 300 yards of straight hedge, 12 feet wide and riddled with berries. South Somerset Ferreters team captain Jeff Jefferson explains the match plan. Well, what we do normally is just long net as long as we can, as long as the long nets will go. If you look at that one there, we sort of put gate nets out across that like a hurdle, so anything that runs up through the, you know. It's like watching the Olympics, watching the dogs do hurdles. <laughs> Now on the team today is the Paul Pogba of West Country Ferreting. We last saw Scott when we were out with another Premiership Ferreting group, Somerset Rabbit Control. Today he's come to help out with the South Somerset Ferreters. What I'm going to do, work up through well, right, and What I want to do is get the whole length all netted up first. Right, with long nets. Right, as far as we can with long nets. Yeah. And then just put all your nets out, mate. All right, go from there. And there. And then just start at the bottom work up. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Very keen, very good ferreter. We've been out a few times with Scott, he's really good. Like an old school ferreter, you know. Very handy bloke to know, really. First thing to do is put out the nets, and we use a variety. Long nets to run the length of the hedge on both sides. Gate nets or hedge nets to block a rabbit's path down the side of the hedge. Smaller run nets or stop nets that do the same thing. And purse nets that go over the individual holes. It's basically just putting run nets all up through the side of the hedge. Because what happens is the hedge is too thick, so rabbits have come out, out the hedge and straight up through the side of the hedge because we've got the dogs out here. And then the, we catch the rabbits as they're running up through in the, in the little stop run nets. Uh, get, well, gate nets a lot bigger. This is only just like four foot nets. Basically just a just a little short sort of stop net sort of thing. They're just four four foot nets really with a peg on. That's all they are, basically. You've got three foot six and four foot. Okay. These are just ones a little bit bigger, which you can put up through the side of the hedge. Basically, when they're running down through, the rabbits will come straight at the holes, at the hedge, and straight into the net as it's running up through the side of the hedge. We've stretched out here two, about 275 yards of net, and it just seems like one straight, complete burrow, so there's no stop and start. It's just, you know, right the way up through. We'd never person at all the holes, so what we do, we're putting the sort of net, nets up in the, the runs and stuff. We've got the gate net stretched across. Scott's also using smaller, what, what he calls stop nets. Yeah, he calls them stop nets. And yours go all the way across? The uh, all yeah, the mine place. stretch out about sort of range from six foot to about 10 foot. And what I have done as well, I've joined two purse nets together to make bigger nets so we can net the, like the big gaps in the hedges and stuff as well. Like I say, so many holes here, Charlie, we'll never ever purse net the whole lot. We haven't got 500 purse nets, you know, so we're just gonna do what we can really and purse net as we go and then pick the nets up and then move them up as we go and hopefully any rabbits that can run back will get caught in the, in the gates nets you know the gate nets and stuff don't ask me how many we're going to catch how many we're going to catch oh my god i'm going to say 30 minimum once the nets are out the ferrets work begins the ferreters push the ferrets into the holes if there is nothing there the ferrets come out if there's something there well this happens Dogs work hard and enthusiastically, but are not always helpful. Now, 
Emily and Esme Jefferson, first cousins and official South Somerset Ferreter cinematographers, are here to film as well. And many of the shots in my film come from them and their camera kit. This is all our filming equipment. Oh no. And what's the bag called? Spill bag. <laughs> You've got a bag called Stephen? Yes, Stephen Spielberg. Thank you, Emily and Esme. You can see their work on the South Somerset Ferreters YouTube channel. The result for the day is a creditable 28 rabbits, which is the South Somerset Ferreters' best day so far this season. We leave Jaff digging for a lost ferret, which is how most ferreters end their days out. It is true to say that there are two kinds of people in the wide, wide world of field sports. Those with loaded guns and those who dig. Jaff digs. So the hedge is like sort of 12 foot wide, and uh, it's just holes everywhere, so it's difficult, but you know, it's working. we're getting there, Charlie. We're getting there. Brilliant. Like British Rail. Yeah. Yeah. That's another load off to the game dealer. For more about the South Somerset Ferreters, click on the link top right to see their YouTube channel or find them on Facebook. 28 rabbits, didn't they do well? Now, from Somerset to the wider world of hunting and shooting, on YouTube it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Alan Brown from Ulster Outdoors and Field Sports gets in touch about his channel, which is mainly about shotgun sports around his home in Northern Ireland. Here is a duck shooting trip on Loch Ney. SRS Power covers ferreting this week. Festive ferreting has him on a lovely morning after rabbits. Dreiss Pross continues his diary of the year with October, November and December, showing the crucial months in the German sporting calendar. It's in German, but you will get the picture. Last week I carried a video about the relatively gentle art of beating on a driven pheasant day. This week, Der Wald. Laufer shows what it's like in the beating line of a German driven wild boar hunt. Lots of shouting. Joe Vargen is in the mountains of Norway after ptarmigan. He calls it a short mood video. There's a new world record Himalayan ibex at 53 inches. This is the film of the last stages of the hunt with happy record holder Hesham Osama Khan. Alex Vankov, who lives in the UK, makes films in Russian about deer stalking and other kinds of hunting. This is his new film showing how he gralics a fallow doe. And finally, what is the matter with the hunt? Why won't they put the fun of hunting on YouTube? Search Boxing Day Hunt on YouTube and you'd think that day is all about the antis. Here is one of the rare exceptions from the Funky Farmer at the Barclay Hunt Boxing Day meet in Thornbury. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Whether or not any of those tickle your collective fancies, we put out our own show last week, Field Sports Ireland, which you can watch by clicking on the eye symbol top right. And following the link, Jason Doyle is out with a pigeon guru over December rape. He looks at how to decoy them in the winter months. Plus, he's off on a two-day stalk in the Wicklow Hills, testing out a variety of stuff, ridgeline clothing and Leica Geovid range-finding binoculars, answering the essential question for any mountain stalker, what happens to bullet drop when you shoot up or downhill? It's all in Field Sports Ireland. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you directly by email about the show, Field Sports Britain, which is at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that. We will see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing. And goodbye. <laughs>